we finish 2 Timothy and the next book is Titus. Titus is the uh, third book in the pastoral epistles. There are four pastoral epistles they're called, personal epistles, written to Titus, uh, Timothy first, two Timothys, and then Titus, and then Philemon. Oftentimes the book of Philemon is not, not uh, contained in the pastoral epistles, but really uh, the book of Philemon is not only the proper book to have as the last, the 13th of Paul's epistles, but it should be included as one of the pastoral epistles. And when we get there, you'll see that. But first there's Timothy and then Titus. And Timothy and Titus were two, two very close associates of the Apostle Paul. If you look there in Titus chapter 1, verse 4, he says, To Titus, mine own son after the common faith. Well, you'll notice back in 1 Timothy, he, he says something very similar to Timothy about that. Um, 1 Timothy 1, verse 2, Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith. And these two, these two men were some of the closest companions that the Apostle Paul had. They were entrusted with great responsibilities and, and as you read through them in the Scripture. Um, they were unswavering, un unswerving, maybe I should say unwavering, that's the word I need, uh, in their loyalty to the Apostle Paul and to sound doctrine. They were willing at different times in, 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 in uh, their lives to be sent on very difficult missions uh, for Paul. Uh, you'll, you'll remember Timothy was sent to, to Thessalonica, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 talks about it. Um, that would be in Acts 17 and it, long in there, which was a very uh, hazardous thing, a lot of con contention going on there. Uh, Tim, uh, Titus went, went, to the, uh, uh, went out with the money, collecting the money for the, the poor saints in Jerusalem, and you read about that in Corinthians and so forth. They were willing to, to shoulder uh, difficult missions uh, in a time when it wasn't traveling. You know, you didn't just go get on the bus and travel somewhere. I was talking to some folks that have retired down in Ecuador. You know, that's, that's the new place. That's, that's the new retirement mecca in the 21st century. You, you're thinking about that too? <laughs> no, please don't. Uh, but uh, people that retire uh, uh, often go to Ecuador. Brother Don Thomas has been down there a number of times in, on, on medical missions. And he told me a couple of years ago that how, how advanced then and how the, the medical profession down there said it's equal to anything that he works with here. But I was reading an article last week about how many Americans have, have actually uh, moved there. Uh, over three, almost 400,000 Social Security checks get sent to South America every, every month. So that means that many people have gone there. That, they said that's twice as many as it was 10 years ago. And because the economy, you can live there much, much more reasonably than you can here and so forth. And you, know, you, you think about going a place like that. And the article, I mentioned it, the article said that they were, one of the, one of the guys was talking about, he said one of the great things is for 13 cents you can get on the bus and ride all over town. <laughs> and he said, we don't, even have a, we don't need a car because we've got public transportation everywhere. And his, well, 13 cents is pretty cheap. And so you say, well, okay. But uh, in Timothy's day, in Titus's day, they didn't have a bus to go get on. You know, you, 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 they could get on a ship, but it's quite dangerous. And, uh, you know, Paul talks about perils of robbers and perils of, uh, uh, and so forth when you're, when you're on the highway and stuff. But they didn't blink about going. These guys were these guys worked with Paul, took assignments from Paul, and they they were uh, of the highest companionship with Paul. So when you're reading about Timothy and Titus, it's not unusual, and it shouldn't be strange. Maybe I should say that Paul would write to them their own assignment. He 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 left Timothy and Macedonia uh, and, and Ephesus when he went into Macedonia. And you'll notice there in, in Titus chapter 1, verse 5, he says, For this cause left I thee in Crete. So he's, le he, he's, he's left them. Th these guys are on assignment working in, 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 the, in the churches here. And it's fascinating to, to see them. You know, when we studied First Timothy, I tried to show you as we went through the book, Timothy, he, he and Titus are entirely different people uh, personality-wise. Timothy is a, he was a, he knew the Holy Scriptures from a child. Chapter 3 of 2 Timothy says he'd been schooled in Scripture from a child. His mother, his grandmother had taught him the Word of God. He was raised in a, he was a, 
Well, I had a Jewish mother and a Gentile, a Greek dad, but he was raised in, in, in studying the Bible. He also was a man who had you know, a health condition, sort of a delicate stomach uh, condition. The, in 1 Timothy 5, he talks about take a little wine for your oft infirmities. Use a little wine for your often. He was, he was someone who had a, had a, a continuing kind of a, of a delicate health kind of problems. He certainly was a tender-hearted guy. Reminds, Paul reminds him of his tears and you know, his mom teaching him and grandma and so forth. And he, he, had, a, he had a very tender heart, but he, he, he has a reputation. People say he was timid. Um, years ago, someone, I, I, I had a friend, he called the book of Timothy, said, Tim, timely tips to timid Timothy in tempestuous times. But I never, I never was really convinced Timothy was a timid guy. Uh, timidity is, is, is sort of, you know, where, where you're not. I, when I read about Timothy, he's more cautious than he is timid. And he's more kind of reserved kind of a person. He wasn't the guy who's going to be in your face all the time. He's also, you know, Paul tells him, don't let anybody despise your youth. He was a young guy. And Paul exhorts him to flee youthful lust in 2 Timothy. So he's still considered to be uh, rather young, even in the time of 2 Timothy. So, uh, it's true that he, he wasn't boisterous, but I'm not so sure about the, the timidity. That, that comes from when he says in 1 Timothy about uh, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and a power of sound mind. The idea is Timothy might have had a little bit of, a little, little bit of timidity and a little fear in him, and he exhorts him you know, to, to be a protector of the afflictions of the gospel, endure hardness, and so forth. But when you look at Timothy overall, He's not really a, a, the kind of guy who was reserved about doing the work. He was just kind of a kind of a more reserved kind of guy. On the other hand, Titus is just the opposite of that. Titus is an in-your-face kind of a, of a brass and bold kind of outspoken guy. You see what he says in verse 5 here. Titus 1, 5, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. Titus is going to go in there and get in their face and things that are wanting, set it right. He's not going to go in and say, maybe we should do this. He's going to go in there and command it. He's going to go get the things right. Verse number uh, 90 says, Beholding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of, of, of the circumcision, whose mouth must be stopped. So when he goes into Crete to set things in order, he's going to have to stand in the face of some people and shut their mouth, stand them down. Um, verse 13, this witness is true. Wherefore, wherefore, here's what he tells Titus, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. So he, he knows Titus is a guy who can get right in, the, in, in, their, in their grill. Come with me to Galatians chapter 2. One of the fascinating things about Titus is um, what a rich life he lived. You know, his um, Titus is not mentioned in the book of Acts. But 12 times in Paul's epistles he's mentioned. That's probably as much if not more than anybody else beside the Apostle Paul. And it's one of those fascinating things. When you read the book of Acts... You're not reading everything about Paul's ministry. When you read the book of Acts, what you're reading about is, is the fall of Israel and God's reasoning and God's just reasoning for sending salvation to the Gentiles without Israel. So you're reading about the diminishing of Israel and Paul's men, conducting his Gentile ministry in a way to be a witness to lost Israel. But you're not reading about everything. People take the book of Acts and read it like that's all Paul did. And boy, it's not. And one illustration of that is Titus. You don't read about Titus anywhere in the book of Acts. But during the time period of the book of Acts, he's absent from the book of Acts, the record of the book of Acts, but he's not absent from the time period of the book of Acts. But you have to learn about that in Paul's epistles. And one of the fascinating things he does, Galatians chapter 2, then 14 years after when I went up to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. Now, that's Acts 15. So Titus has already been saved. He's already working with Paul, been trained by Paul, 
is trusted by Paul as much as Barnabas, and he takes him to Jerusalem, to the council there in Jerusalem, to that conference in Jerusalem with the, with the uh, Jerusalem leaders and elders to discuss, and, and, and to verse 2 he says, I went up by revelation to communicate unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which are of reputation, lest by any means I should have run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privately to spout our liberty, who we have, which we have in Christ, that, that, they, that um, they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. In other words, Paul went, goes there and he faces down those people who are trying to get the Gentiles circumcised. He takes Titus with him as a test case. And Titus, well, he gets to meet the 12 apostles. Well, there are only 11 at the time James had been killed. He gets to meet the Jerusalem elders. So he's got a rich, you know, a rich uh, portfolio of, of life. But he's also the kind of guy that Paul took with him Nobody was going to push Titus into doing something that wasn't right. So Titus, has got a, he's got a rich history, a very colorful life, and uh, he, he's not somebody who's bashful about standing up. Paul knew that he would contend with him. So Titus, is, is, he's, he's not the timid kind of a guy or the cautious kind of a guy or the reserved kind of guy that, that Timothy was. Titus is more of the bold-natured, outspoken kind of guy that is going to deal with that. Timothy's epistles, by the way, and when you see Timothy's ministry, it's almost, Timothy's dealing with doctrine. And he, he'll go on and deal with doctrinal things. It's Timothy, he, in 1 Timothy, in 1 Corinthians 2, uh, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 4, uh, one of these passages that we, that we use a lot about following Paul, 1 Timothy 4 First, uh, first Corinthians, I'm sorry, First Corinthians chapter 4. First Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. First Corinthians 4, 16. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. So when he says, follow me, and I sent Timothy down there to teach you the doctrine that I'm teaching that you need to, need to follow. And when you see Timothy, it's, Timothy is, is more, the emphasis is on the doctrinal issues that are there. In 1 Timothy, that's what he does. He leaves him in 1 Timothy, said, I left you there in Ephesus to do what? Te tell him, don't teach, charge him, teach no other doctrine. Don't give heed to fables and his genealogies, but give yourself to godly edifying. Titus, on the other hand, his emphasis, and, and when you see him working, if you come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, Titus also spent a lot of time at, F, at, at Corinth. He, um, he spent time at Corinth exhorting the Corinthians to get on with what they're supposed to be doing. And when Titus is ministry at Corinth focuses not simply on doctrine, but on the application, on the discipline that the doctrine needs to produce. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, in this chapter, these two chapters where he talks about the, the offering for the poor saints of Jerusalem, uh, verse number 6, insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also, they had, become, they had been delinquent in giving the offering that they'd promised to give. So what does he do? Well, you promised Titus, so I'm sending him back down there to get the money to get your offering. Verse 16, but thanks be to God, which put the same earnest care into, into the heart of Titus for you. So Titus is, is, is someone who is ministering to the Corinthians, working with them, disciplining, seeking to get them to... to uh, uh, come up with the, the, uh, the, the, the needed things that need to be done. Verse number 23, uh, 2 Corinthians 8, 23. Whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow he helper 
concerning you. See that kind of status that he has? Our, or our brethren be inquired of, they're the messengers of the churches and the glory of Christ. Wherefore, show you to them, and besides the church, and before the churches, the proof of your love and of our boasting on your behalf. So they're, they're, the emphasis that Titus is involved in is uh, getting him to fulfill things. And when we come to the book of Titus, what you're going to find is that kind of a thing in the book of Titus, because he's going to go there and he's going to set things in order. He's going to bring discipline to what's there. And like I said, he had a, quite a colorful life. I, I, I think it's when you read about Titus and the rest of the scripture, you think, wow, here's a guy trained by the Apostle Paul. Now, he was trained with Ty Timothy was, Gaius, Aristarchus, Tychicus, Trophimus, Epaphroditus. I mean, all these guys had, but Titus is one of them. Uh, he worked in the churches in Galatia, in Syria, in Greece, Italy, the three major land masses where Paul uh, raised up churches. Titus worked in all those areas. He was a, a great help to the Corinthians. And when Paul left him, but he, uh, sent him to Crete, he left him. Paul took him to Crete and he left him at Crete. Now, Crete is an island. You, you, you know where Crete is if you look at a map. It's an island in the Mediterranean on the west eastern end of the Mediterranean uh, off the coast of North Africa. It's a big island. Not, not a little island, but a big island. And it, it, has a, it had an interesting ministry. If you go back to Acts 27, the Apostle Paul went there in the midst of a, of a storm. He's on his way to Rome. He's, in, he's a prisoner. And in Acts chapter 27, he's in, in the custody of the, of the Roman soldiers here. Verse, 20, verse 1, and, and it was determined that we should sail into Italy. When it was determined we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and, and certain other prisoners under one name, Julius, a centurion of, of uh, Augustus' band, and into a ship. And they they're gonna they get in the boat and they're gonna they're gonna sail from uh, Palestine, from Israel to uh, Italy. Now they have some problems. Verse number three. The next day we touched Sidon, and Julius courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to uh, go unto his friends to refresh himself. So he goes ashore. And when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus, on the leeward side, because the winds were contrary. When we had sailed over the sea of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Lycia. And there the centurions found a ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. So that now they've changed ships. And when we had sailed slowly many days and scarce uh, were come over against uh, Snidus, the winds not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Salmone, Salmone, and hardly passing it, came unto a place which is, is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was the city of Lycia. Now when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous because of the fast, because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them and said unto them, Sirs, I perceive this voyage will be with, with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading of the ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. So they, they leave. Verse number 21, they leave, they get in a big storm. Now there's trouble, verse 21, but after much abs uh, abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them, saying, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete and have gained here this harm and loss. Now what I'm reading that for you to see is they, they were at Crete, back in verse 8, 9, and 10, 
They're on, they're on the island of Crete. Then they leave, and then they get in trouble. And Paul says, we should have stayed there, I told you. <laughs> now, if you look at verse number 10, number 9, now when much time was spent, when sailing was now dangerous, because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them. Now when he says the fast was already passed, he's talking about the Jewish, pa uh, uh, the Jewish fast. Um, and you say, well, why would, why would that be involved in it? Hold your hand and come back with me to Acts chapter 2. And again, the book of Acts is designed to show you Paul's interchange and interplay primarily with Israel. You're not seeing in this story Paul's ministry in the body of Christ, the dispensation of grace and, and that kind. You're, you're, I mean, you're, that is there. But the focus in Acts is on Paul's touching and ministering to an effect on fallen Israel. And it's fascinating in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, verse, uh, verse 5. There were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now look down at verse 11. Some of those nations, some of those Jews were from where? Crete. So there's a colony of Jews on Crete who are in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost that hear Peter and those people preaching. So, what, so there's a group of Israel on the island of Crete when Paul goes there. Now, the next time you hear about Crete, he's, he's leaving Titus on Crete. Obviously, while Paul's on, 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 the, on the island, the Jews are observing the, the, the fast. Paul obviously is doing it with them. You say, what's he doing? Well, he's doing what he did back in chapter 22 and 23 and 24 and 25. He's witnessing. He's, he's in there doing his thing as his manner was to go to those unsaved Jews and preach the gospel to them. If you go back to Acts 17, he talks about as his manner was. He went in, opened the scriptures, and taught them that Jesus, Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And, you're, and, and then he gave them, he, in Acts 28, he says, For the hope of Israel, I'm bound with this chain. That's not saying I'm bound for the hope of Israel in the kingdom. Because their kingdom hope wasn't viable at that time. But the only hope any lost Jew had during this period of time, as it is today, was in the message Paul was preaching. And Paul carried on, he, in Acts 13, Acts 11, just hang over there with me real quick. In Acts 11, 13, a verse we quote all the time about Paul's apostleship. But we, we kind of take it out of what he's saying. Acts chapter 11, verse 11, I say then have they, and that's Israel, stumble that they should fall, God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Why? Well, salvation went to the Gentiles to form the body of Christ, didn't it? But that's not what he's talking about here. Romans 9, 10, and 11 is a, is a discussion about the dispensational situation with the nation Israel. What's happened to Israel in the dispensation when God changed the program? What's Israel's status? And Paul says, through the fall of Israel, salvation has gone to the, Gentile, to, to the Gentiles. Look, for to provoke them, Israel, to jealousy. So God's sending salvation out to the Gentiles over there who've fallen. They've lost their program. They've turned their back on God. He sends salvation to the Gentiles to provoke those unsaved Jews to jealousy. To do what? to desire God's Word. Verse, 12, verse 13. Or verse 12. For if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I'm going out there as the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify my office. Why does he do that? If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, Israel, unsaved Israel, and might save some of them. Paul is conducting his Gentile apostleship in a way as to be a witness to lost Jews 
that here is where God's working. Your God has left you, gone out among the Gentiles, and you need to come and join the Gentiles and trust Christ. So when Paul, evidently, when Paul was at Crete, he went in. I read that chapter 27, verse 9, and usually you, people just, you read over that, the fast was now already passed. He said, well, you know, I'm thinking, why, was, why did he put that? Because obviously Paul is having some ministry on Crete. The result of that ministry is that some people get saved. He gets some converts, and he establishes some people. Titus 1.5, he'd ordain elders in every city. That would be every city where they had people that needed to be ordained, I suppose. But the, the thing there is, there are, there are there was a, a, a starting of a ministry Converts gain, people getting saved. Evidently, Paul goes back. Now, I don't, you can't really tell when Titus was written except a verse like this. You remember when we studied 1 Timothy, I, I tried to show you that Paul is in prison. He's a prisoner until Acts 28. The book of Acts ends. He's in prison. He's in his, a hired house, but he's still in chains. Then you read something like 1 Timothy, I left you in Macedonia. There's nowhere in the book of Acts that fits. I left you in Crete. There's nowhere in the book of Acts to fit that. So there are places that Paul talks about in 1 Timothy and in Titus and in, and in uh, the, 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 what are called the, the uh, prison epistles, uh, the pastoral epistles, that indicate that Paul was released from prison had at least a one to two year time of traveling, Macedonia, that's in Greece, Crete, so forth, across the Mediterranean, and then he's re-imprisoned. So between 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, there's a time period where he's, where he, between, between the end of the book of Acts and 1 Timothy, he's released from prison, and then in 2 Timothy, he's put back in prison. So it's what's called the two imprisonments of Paul. Well, Titus and Timothy would have been, 1 Timothy would have been written during that, that time of his freedom because he, he goes to Crete and he leaves Titus there just like he was in Macedonia and left Timothy there. So he's back out traveling again. You say, where was he going? Well, Romans chapter 15 said he was going to Spain. <laughs> the dude's got some plans. He's not sitting around saying, well, I wonder what to do now that I'm old. He's got plans and and the government's getting in his way, but he's not letting grass grow under his feet while he's got some freedom. And so he goes to Crete, and evidently there already were some believers there. And uh, he's, he's going to leave Titus at Crete. Now, if you look down in chapter 1, verse 5, he says, For this cause I left thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I appointed thee. If you go down to verse, verse uh, 10, for there are many unruly and vain talkers, well, verse 9, holding fast the, the faith, this is what the elders need to do, holding fast the faith of the word as they've been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. A gainsayer is somebody that contradicts and speaks against what's being taught. So there are people on Crete preaching against what Paul had preached, whose mouth, uh, verse 10, for there are many unruly and vain talkers, deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. So there are a bunch of unsaved Jews there, would be the ones that were at Pentecost, in Jerusalem back at Pentecost, heard that message. Now they hear Paul, they see some of the their brethren get saved, see other people get saved, and they're opposing it. So all of this... It, it, in my mind, there's a reason he leaves Titus there. And Titus is a guy who will get in their, in their grill and, and deal with them. So when you come to Titus, you're coming to a book that's written to some people who, have, or who are in the midst of a great deal of opposition to the truth that Paul's preaching. Now, with all that in, in mind, come to verse 1. Paul, a servant of God, 
and an apostle of Jesus Christ. So he's a servant. He understands his position. I love the way he describes himself. He's a servant of God. He knows his position. He's a, a servant. And he's an apostle. He knows his calling. He knows his purpose. He knows who he is. He's a servant. He's nobody. But he's an apostle. He's got a purpose and a calling. His apostleship, he's a servant of God, by the way, and he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. That's who sent him. His apostleship is according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness. In other words, Paul's apostleship is according to the faith. Now, when it says the faith, that's the doctrine, that's the truth of God's elect. Now, when you look at that word election, Alex has been teaching on, in, in, in the morning hour on, on Sundays, on uh, the first hour, about Calvinism. Theology takes words in the Bible, attributes bogus meanings to them, and then scares people away from the words in the Bible. I told you years ago, back in the 80s, a lady called me up on the, uh, listening to the radio program, and she says, Jordan, I want one of them dispensations you keep talking about. <laughs> and she's a Roman Catholic, and she wanted a dispensation, which is a Catholic use of a good Bible word to do some nefarious things in religion. Well, when she heard that, she thought I'm, I'm talking, you know, what she heard wasn't what the Bible says. Well, the term election is not talking about law. Well, the term elect never refers to lost people or saved people among lost. In Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1, Jesus Christ is called, God calls Jesus Christ my elect. Jesus Christ was never lost. The elect, that is a title that describes people that are saved. I get two passages, get Colossians chapter 3 and 1 Timothy, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Colossians 3 and 1 Timothy chapter 1. The word, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and Colossians chapter 3. I, I'm be sure I'm saying that right one time anyway. In Ephesians 1, when he says that uh, he, uh, according as he hath chosen us in him before the uh, foundation of the world. Choosing. The word elect means to choose. The title, the elect, is a description. It's a title given to people who are the chosen ones. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God. That's who you are, holy and beloved. That's who you are. It's a term about your identity. Now, who is it that God has chosen to save? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. Here's a verse that can take the burden of Calvinistic delusion predestination, election, and all that business uh, for salvation, and just throw all that stuff off of your back. 1 Corinthians 1, 21. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Notice that the sovereign free will of Almighty God is to, to save them that believe. So who did God choose to save? Them that believe. In the eternal counsels of the Godhead in eternity past, that you hear so much about in theology, they talk about lapsarianism, sublapsarianism, superlaps. All, all that stuff is just philosophical speculations produced by a bunch of pinheads that don't have any idea uh, about letting the Bible be their authority. They just got a system they want to promote, and it's just it's philosophical speculation based on nothing except paganism. 
That one verse tells you, in the wisdom of God, His sovereign free will is to save them that believe. So who did God choose to save? Them that believe. So if you believe, who are you? You're one of those whom God chose to save. You are the elect. It is a title of believers. By the way, predestination in the Bible, where it's used four times, twice in Romans, one, uh, Romans 8, twice in Ephesians 1, all four times is talking about God. It's not talking about lost people at all. It's talking about God taking saved people and predetermined your destiny. Did you know as a believer your destiny is predetermined? <laughs> You've been predestinated into the adoption of children. By the way, your adoption doesn't take place now. It takes place in the future at the rapture. The adoption to with the redemption of your body. But the spirit that will give you that position of sonship is the spirit that lives in you now and allows you to speak now as though you are resurrected from the dead. So you have that identity capacity now, but the adoption doesn't take... That's why you are predestinated to it. Predestinated to the adoption of children. You're a child now. But God desires His children to be adults, and that's what He'll do with us at the rapture. But that's... That's all believers. So when he says here, his apostleship is according to the faith of God's elect, that is the body of Christ. Paul's apostleship is according to the sound doctrine of the body of Christ. And the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness. The objective of the truth is godliness. When it says it's after godliness, it means it's going after. It's pursuing it. It's seeking. Here's some truth that's going after godliness. How are you going to find godliness? You're going to find it in the truth, in the acknowledging of the truth that comes to you from the apostleship of Paul, which is according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. You've got to recognize that there is truth revealed and committed to the Apostle Paul. Look at verse, verse 3. But hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me, according to the commandment of God our Savior. So that you have to recognize that there is, there is the truth committed to the Apostle Paul, that you, you get the truth that produces godliness from the doctrine committed to Paul. Godliness comes from believing and obeying the truth of the message committed to the Apostle Paul. That's where, God, that's where God-likeness today comes. So Paul says, I'm a servant of God. I know who I am. And I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. I know what I'm doing. My apostleship is according to the faith, the sound doctrine, the the truth of God's elect, the body of Christ, and the acknowledging of the truth that my apostleship reveals, which is after godliness. It's going to produce godliness. And I say again, Titus is going to focus on that issue of the godliness, the, the discipline that the doctrine is going to produce in hope of eternal life. The truth committed to Paul that produces godliness is founded in, it's in hope, it's founded in the hope of eternal life. What is that? Which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. But hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior. I read that verse. That that verse is so so simple to read. The Bible's not that hard to understand. It's often very hard to read. This morning Herman had uh, an article he'd written. He asked me, so would you read that and explain to me why when people read this, he's, he's ministering to some folks down in the city, and in a Hispanic community, and 
Herman the German talking, you know, down there ministering to the Spanish because he's from Venezuela and they all speak Spanish. But um, he said, I can't get them to see this. And he's got it written half in, it's in Spanish and English. So I read the English. And I mean, it was spot on. Boom. There it is. Boom. There it is. Boom. There it is. What? He said, how can I? I said, I don't, I, don't, I wouldn't have any idea how to tell you to improve it. Usually you can tell somebody, you know, maybe take this out or put that in. It was, it was spot on. And he says, well, then why can't people see it? Because <laughs> they don't want to. You know, well, if they're not, if they're saved. This is one of these passages that you read it to somebody and, say, and they say, okay, so? And you go, what? In hope of eternal life, it's God that cannot lie. Promise before the... In other words, before the world began, before he created anything, God promised to do something. But in due time, manifested. It wasn't manifested until the due time testifier showed up. Manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me. So there's this promise God had before the world began that he doesn't tell anybody about until he manifests it through preaching committed to Paul. And all of that is according to the commandment of God, our Savior. So there's something revealed for the body of Christ, the elect of God today, that God planned from before the foundation of the world, but only revealed it in due time. Now Paul loves that due time term. Look, look back at 1 Timothy chapter 2. 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, watch, to be testified in due time. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ should lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Paul said, my whole ministry is about being the due time testifier of what God accomplished through the cross work of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are some things that God planned to do through the cross work of Christ that he didn't reveal to anybody until he revealed it to the apostle Paul. Now, Titus starts out with that little introduction. He doesn't say, hi, Titus, until you get to verse 4. The first thing he does is he tells you, I know who I am, and I know what I'm doing, and I know what I'm preaching. And if there's going to be godliness, God-likeness, if, it's going to, if you're going to find out what God's doing, it's going to be accomplished down there at Crete, it's going to be accomplished in... Chicago, anywhere, is going to be based on the commandment of what God's doing today. That's why he writes in 1 Corinthians 14, If any man think of set to be spiritual or prophet, let him acknowledge that things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. People ask me, well, Brother Rick, do you think you should keep the commandments? I always say Yes. <laughs> Which ones? They say, well, the Ten Commandments. I say, well, you ought to. How are you doing? You ain't doing so good to them, are you? Well, if people ask you that because they think they are, and you'd have a discussion with them and find out they aren't. But there's a commandment of God it would be good to keep. That commandment, if you look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, 1 Timothy 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by what? The commandment of God. Sometimes people say, well, you guys make too much of Paul. Well, we're making a lot of the commandment of God. That's why Paul said, I magnify my office. It's not him. Who is he? He's a servant. 1 Corinthians 1, he says, if a man so account of us as the ministers of Christ... 
and stewards of the mysteries of God. A minister is a servant. A steward is someone who takes someone else's stuff and hands it out and takes care of it for them. The issue is the master. Well, that's who Paul is. So he starts out, Titus, stating the authority. Now, you, you look down at chapter 2, verse 15. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. He is to speak, exhort, rebuke with all authority. That is all authority of the Word of God rightly divided. That's why he starts with that issue. Because Titus is going to be speaking with all authority. And the all authority there is the all authority of the Word of God rightly divided. It's the commandment of God. Now, you can use that verse and say, well, that verse is talking about the Bible. It is. But it's talking about the Bible rightly divided. And that's why he starts the way he does. Okay, it's time to stop. We'll pick up there next time and get on down a little further in the book. But we're gonna, we'll spend a little more time verse 2 and 3 next time, okay? Anyway, that's the start for the book of Titus, and we'll work our way through that in our future editions. Okay? All right. Just three chapters, so it won't take more than two years, right? <laughs> Father, we thank you tonight for your goodness and your grace to us. We thank you for our, 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 our possession of a book that allows us to speak with all authority because it is the absolute authority of the universe. We thank you for that in Christ.